Good morning. Welcome to our presentation on the use of laser triangulation and deep neural networks for railway track safety inspections. My name is Richard Fox Ivy, and my co presenter is Ryan Harrington. This is a federally funded project funded by the FRA and a joint effort between Railtech and Railmetrics. A little overview on the project. So the overall mission of the project is to evaluate the potential for 3D laser triangulation and DNN technologies to provide value added inspection data to existing geometry car inspection systems. Two phases in the project. We've already completed phase one. It ran from May 2019 to October of last year. And we're currently in phase two, which started in November 2020 and will run until April of next year. Big picture objectives uh, to improve the railway network safety through improved reliability and robustness of track inspections. And two, to provide value added inspection data to existing geometry car inspection systems in two different scenarios. First one where you have no prior knowledge, you're traveling on a track for the very first time. Second one, which is really the focus of this project, I would say, is where you're doing repeat inspections and you're detecting changes between those repeat inspections. Uh, we are proud to have uh, a number of key industry partners to lend their expertise to us, including BNSF, CN, and CSX. Let me give a little background on kind of the industry, though, before we talk about this technology. So uh, currently, classes six and up, the inspection process is visual. It's costly, time consuming. Obviously, that impacts tra track uh, capacity and you're putting people in harm's way. You've got people walking along the track. Um, now, uh, machine vision type approaches are coming um, into the industry now, which is great, um, and they're quite good at processing large amounts of data. But when it comes to the analysis of the images that those systems capture, they really typically rely on human derived processes or algorithms. Um, so they're limited to problems that the designer can solve. There's a human being that figures out what is the right algorithm to detect this thing or to measure this thing. Um, whereas a deep neural network is actually a subset of machine learning. And uh, what's unique about DNNs is that they develop their own analysis method, like a human being uh, does, like a, a, a human neural network. Um, and so you've got an opportunity to solve things in ways that a human might never think of. Um, and also they're capable of learning over time and you don't need to go back and kind of reinvent the wheel and retrain them um, every time you want to uh, do additional analysis or look at uh, an additional track, for example. Okay, so big picture project approach, and we're gonna dig into each of these areas. So I'm not gonna cover everything that's in this slide, but um, start of the project, we did field our field work, um, which involved 3D scanning on TTCI's high tonnage loop during six weeks of fast operations. So the fast train is an accelerated loading train, um, and it runs every night um, over the operation period and creates a ton of damage and a ton of change on the track. So really great environment to create a lot of change, which is what we're trying to find. Um, so uh, we did both scans uh, every week of uh, operation of the fast train, and we also did a walking survey at the beginning for ground truth. We then took the 3D data from the system to prepare training data for the DNN, um, and that was a, a manual process wherein the Railtech team was annotating images, indicating what they saw in the images and what conditions were present, um, which my uh, partner Ryan will talk about in detail. Um, then the results from that process were used to actually train the DCNN. Um, training a DCNN is a little bit like uh, showing, you know, flashcards to to a child, right? If you wanted to teach a child the difference between a dog or a cat, you might show it a whole bunch of images of dogs, a whole bunch of images of cats, and eventually it's going to learn, you know, what the difference is. So that, that's kind of a way of thinking about DCNN training. Um, then we did a, a very thorough evaluation of the performance of the uh, deep neural network, and then finally the um, outputs from the DNN analysis of those repeat runs went into a change detection algorithm to uh, detect the difference between those runs. 
So uh, you might have seen I kind of snuck in DCNN there. Um, what do we mean by DCNN? This is yet another deep neural network. Um, well, it's a, it is a, another type of deep neural network. Uh, it's specialized in image processing. Um, and um, it's important because normally computers and, and deep neural networks, when they look at images, they really just see an array of numbers. Uh, they don't see the three, you know, cute little dogs that are running through the grass there that a human being does. And and um, so if you want to process image-based data, really a convolutional neural network is the type of DNN that you want. Um, and as I said before, you it's a process when you're training it of um, having a, a human being or an expert inspector say, you know, this is this feature, this is this condition, and you give it lots of examples, and if you give it enough examples, it figures out what it is that you're trying to tell it in its own way, develops its own method. Okay, so how do we get those images? Um, so the 3D scanning system was a, a high rail trailer mounted system. It captures a one by one millimeter scan of the track. It's about a 3.5 meter wide scan, so it gets the ties, it gets the ballast, it gets the, the, the rail heads. Um, and the files are saved every two meters, so it chops them into two meter lengths. It operates day or night. Uh, there's no additional lighting that's required. Uh, there's a, a high accuracy GPS system to geo-reference everything. There's a wheel encoder, a DMI, to trigger the system to capture data, tell it when the system's moving, when it's stopped, um, as well as to linear reference everything. And then inside the high rail uh, vehicle is an operator um, with a tablet where they can uh, download the data and, and review results. So the system actually captures two types of data, which is kind of unique. So if you think of most of the machine vision type systems that are uh, at use in our industry, they're really 2D based line scan type imaging systems. So you just have a picture of the, of the surface. Uh, this system captures a 2D intensity scan like that line scan, but also a 3D range scan. Um, and in this image, the shading of the pixels, this image on the bottom here, corresponds to the distance between the surface and the scanner. So things that are light, like the tops of these rails and the tops of the spikes, they're, they're uh, high off the ground. And things that are dark, they're low on the ground. So we get a 2D image and a 3D model. But this is like a bit of a weird way to look at it in a planner view. Let me show you in a 3D way. I think that's uh, much better to understand uh, the data this way. So the top image here, the colorized image, is an LAS output format, which is a standard LiDAR kind of format. Um, and the colors here uh, indicate the different elevations. So hot colors, warm colors are high, and low uh, colors are shown in cool, uh, or low surfaces are shown in, in cool colors. And then you have a, a sort of more of just a black and white image from the system showing 3D uh, look to it as well. So the system um, actually, when it comes to data collection, it's actually grabbing it one line at a time. So you have a sensor that is pulsing a laser more than 20,000 times a second. And there's a synchronized camera that's taking a picture of that laser line. And every pulse, it's capturing the intensity data, that 2D image, and the 3D data. And so as the inspection system rolls down the track, depending on where that laser light falls, you know, if it's on a high surface, you can see that it falls in uh, a different part of the camera. And if it's on a low surface, it, 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 it falls in a different part of the camera as well. So that is how the system effectively triangulates the surface. This is the top of our triangle, and this is a base of the triangle between the line laser and the camera. And at this point, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Ryan to um, handle the next phase. Thank you, Richard. So we collected all of our line scan data at the high tonnage loop in Playboy, Colorado during the fall 2019 FAST operations. The data was collected over a six week period between September 10th and October 23rd, 2019 and we were able to collect 22 complete circuit runs around the high tonnage loop, with each run having roughly 2,000 3D scan files. In addition to collecting all of the data from the high rail vehicle, we were able to conduct a ground truth inspection where we used a tablet to manually record data that we saw in the field. And by compiling this data, we were able to identify 15 potential features of interest over 7,500 cross ties uh, that were inspected by their type, section, number, and material. 
Next slide, please. So once we were able to collect all of our data, we were able to enter the DNN training process where we selected one of the 22 runs to serve as our training data set. And the process would essentially work by first engaging in the DNN training where manually annotated image with manually annotated images would be fed into a DNN for learning. The trained DNN would be used to reprocess the training data set, and then that those uh, outputs would be sent to Railtech for review. And then Railtech would undergo training refinement where they would manually annotate everything that the DNN got wrong, and they would send those annotated images back to rail metrics so that they could retrain the DNN to account for those errors. And this process of DNN training and training refinement would repeat several times until the DNN was able to identify almost all of the features. Next slide. So just an example of what we would see earlier. We have a, the left image is an intensity image and the right image is a range image. The first thing that it identifies are the rails, which are shown in pink, next slide. And then it would identify the cross ties, which are shown in green. And then once it identified the cross ties, it would go and identify whatever features might be associated with those cross ties. In this case, it identified the fasteners in blue, yellow, and red boxes. Next slide. So if we try to identify each of these, you will see that the blue are identified as fasteners that are present. Next slide. The yellow will identify uh, features that are there but are covered. Next slide. And then the red identifies areas where the fasteners should be there, but are absent. Next slide. And then occasionally the DNN just would not identify the fastener as it should be there or it shouldn't be there, as you can see in the top left corner. Next slide. And as you can probably guess, that was a very early example of DNN analysis. So we were able to go and fix this by creating these little red bounding boxes that uh, correct the DNN for what it needs to see. So if you look in the top image here, you're going to notice that, yes, it is a blue box. The DNN identified that a fastener should be there, but it didn't identify the correct type of fastener. It needed to identify a PR clip or type one clip. So the box had to be manually adjusted. And then if you look below that, uh, nothing was identified. So we had to go and draw the red bounding box to account for the fact that that fastener is there. So if we jump into the next slide, you'll see that we have a more typical example of training where all of the blue boxes that were identifying the fasteners as present were properly adjusted if they did not identify the fastener correctly. Similarly, the bounding boxes for the other colors, like say the red one where the clip should be present but is not, that was identified correctly, but the box still needs adjustments so that it knows roughly where that fastener should have been if it was there. Next slide. So just some important uh, notes about the DNN training process is that we ended up with the best and worst case scenario. The HTL provided plenty of changes over this short period of time. However, from a DNN tra training perspective, it's challenging. Training for both humans and DNNs require uh, similar examples of each condition. And unfortunately, the HTL is a very heterogeneous segment of track over its 2.7 mile length, and it constantly changes. 
This is not even to mention the numerous cross type types, the numerous clip types, numerous tie plates, the numerous spike patterns, and it's not even to mention all of the random hardware that you end up seeing along the track that the algorithms have to ignore. Essentially what we're saying is, is that it is significantly harder to train a DNN on the high tonnage loop than it would be to train it on a more homogeneous class one track. And it's amazing that we actually got it to work as well as you will see when Richard presents the next set of slides. Great, thanks Ryan. Um, yeah, I have to say personally, I was really surprised. Um, initially, I thought the HTL would have been a, just a great um, data set <laughs> for this application, but uh, really challenging. It's, you know, it's not like normal track. You don't have miles and miles of the same fastener in a row. You, you might only have a few examples of a particular fastener uh, uh, and tie plate combination, and that's tough to train. Um, so uh, change detection. Uh, we're at the point where we've collected the data, we've trained the deep neural network, uh, we've evaluated the performance of the of the deep neural network, and uh, we're now ready to use it as a change detection tool. So first step, analyze the first run. Second step, analyze the second run. So this is a process to kind of characterize what is there. Uh, let's have the DNN tell us what fasteners are present, what ties are present, uh, what is the condition state of those fasteners? What is the condition state of those ties? Uh, what is the condition state of ballast, you know, ballast level, um, ballast surface balling, those kinds of things. Um, so once we've done that analysis, the next step is we've got to make sure we're looking at the same position on the track. And I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a second, so I'll leave this for, for just a slide. Um, once we've aligned those two runs and we're talking about the same point, we can then output differences. So what is the difference between run one and run two? And then finally, we can uh, output those differences in maybe a tabular format like an Excel spreadsheet um, or in a format which I really like in a geographic map based kind of way of looking at the data, which I'll show you an example in, in just a moment. OK, so thinking of run to run alignment, um, the challenge with any kind of inspection that you're doing um, with technology like this is that the inspection vehicle never starts or stops in the same location. In fact, it doesn't even necessarily go in the same direction, right? You could be traveling up chain or down chain. Um, so you need to have a way of determining what are the points, what is the position in run one or run A that corresponds to the position in run B or run two. Um, so a methodology was developed uh, that is automated that first starts by using GPS between the two runs to get close. You know, within a meter or so, within a few feet, uh, anyone that's used GPS knows it's, uh, despite what the GPS manufacturers will tell you about millimeters and centimeters, um, in real life, you, you often don't get um, that kind of accuracy. So first phase is to use GPS to get close. Um, and the second phase uses 3D shape matching between the features in those two runs. So, um, okay, I, I think I'm at about the same position. Um, I think I'm looking at the same tie here, for example. Uh, is it uh, the same skew angle? Does it have the same dimensions? Uh, what are the uh, fasteners that are present there? What are the tie plates that are present there? And it works outward from that one matching feature to the adjacent features just to validate that, hey, am I looking at the same position on the track? Uh, yes, I am. I see enough features because there will be natural changes as well. So we, the methodology has to account for that. Um, so in this case, you can see um, we're looking at changes in ballast height. So these pink areas, uh, that's a low ballast. It's been filled in. And then on the right hand side, we can see low ballast areas. I mean, there's even uh, it's so low that it's like a hole in the data. Um, and now we can see that they're filled in later on. Okay, so let me give you a few examples of what this uh, looks like for um, different features, different types of data. Uh, so September 10, we have uh, on the left rail, we see there's a fastener to the left of the rail, and there's a missing fastener, an E-clip on the right of the rail. And if we can see just for everyone's frame of reference, we're just before the safe lock start. October 23, we can see, okay, I'm just at the start of the safe lock. And now if I look at this position, I see that there's an eclip missing to the left of the left rail. And if we zoom in, we can see those two uh, boxed in red. Spike height change example. So, okay, 
not even thinking about whether we have spikes that have gone missing between runs, but even something more subtle. What is the average height of spikes in um, th uh, four regions of interest? So one on the left hand side of the left rail, one on the right hand side of the left rail. So one, two and then three and four. So in this case, we can see uh, all these spikes have blue boxes. That means that they are um, within the allowable height tolerance set for this project. This, this one here is highlighted in red. That means it's over the threshold, um, which was 30 millimeters in this case. And we see the spike uh, height. Uh, so this is 20 millimeters. This is the mean spike height to the left of the rail. And we're looking at this position in the track here in the graph. So this one that's circled in red. And if we go forward in the future, we now see that we have two spikes that have been highlighted in red, and we see the average height, uh, spike height is doubled. Um, so it's now 40 millimeters um, uh, compared to the 20 millimeters. And these other uh, dots on the graph are showing, you know, anything that's above zero is going to be an increase in height, and anything that's below zero is gonna be a decrease, right? Because sometimes you go and you do maintenance, you knock down spikes. Uh, another type of data example. So this is looking at ballast height changes. And uh, I think that the, the colorized elevation data is a really great way to see this because we can kind of see October 10, October 7, very, very similar, nothing's happened, but now we have um, more ballast that has been um, placed here on the uh, bottom side. Uh, but we also have areas where it was removed. You know, we have these two spots here, the September 10th, uh, October 7, very similar. And now uh, October 23, we can see that the ballast has been removed there. It's another uh, change that was detected. Another example of a change, uh, you know, they're doing so much uh, wear on these rails that they're having to cut out pieces of rail and install joints. Um, so you can see in run one, we have no joint and a zero bolt count, as you can imagine. And then um, run two, we now have a bolt uh, or a, a joint that's been installed and uh, it uh, uh, the count here is a change in bolt count so we can look at um, you know uh, what is the number of joints at a location as well as what is the number of bolts maybe you lost two bolts maybe you added two um, or the joint itself maybe the joint uh, got uh, tighter you know it's a little wider here than it is in the second one uh, or maybe it got uh, uh, wider um, so cross tie skew um, so you're looking at a graph here wherein um, you're comparing the skew between different sets of data, September 10 versus 23, 10 versus October 3rd, 10 versus 23. Um, and anything that's above zero is where the skew angle increased. Anything that's below is where it decreased. And you can kind of see, you know, once you get um, kind of a clump of points, you can see that um, something, you know, did happen here at, at around 200, section 200. Um, uh, September 10 versus 23 and versus October 3rd, a number of skew angle decreases. These are increases. And in this example down here, we have a decrease. Um, a little bit hard to see, but uh, focus on this tie at the top. That is the one that changed. And if you kind of look at it uh, in respect of the rails, you see there's a definitely an angle there. And we can see it's pretty much um, 90 degrees now in the second. And it says 2.55 degrees and we have point. 71 degrees there. And my kind of favorite way of looking at the data, um, at least from a, a big picture perspective, is to kind of say, okay, well, it's we're not maybe so interested in just one change. I mean, one spike is higher. That, that's not too interesting. Or we lost one fastener, we replaced one. But maybe we want to think about where the clusters of changes in our network. Uh, where do we have multiple fasteners that are changing status? Multiple are being lost. Um, and and then uh, where do we have multiple of those clusters? So this is an area where this dark push pin, uh, there are 20 fasteners uh, in a close proximity that changed their status. And then we have an 11, uh, which is here. And then this one probably is about seven. So something is definitely happening at this point in the track. And uh, that's where I would want to focus my attention. Whereas this part here, yeah, not, not very significant kind of change. Okay, so uh, thinking of, of the way forward, um, we're super excited uh, to continue the next phase of this research um, as part of a revenue service demonstration on a high tonnage class one mainline, um, which is going to allow us to do a number of things. 
Um, one, to further refine our algorithms to detect a variety of conditions that were not observed on the HTL at TTC. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the HTL is not regular track, so it's it's uh, you, you, you don't always see all the things you want to see. Um, and specifically, we want to see normal tonnage induced kind of changes on a, a regular revenue service track. Um, we're also using some of our prior data from the HTL um, to develop metrics to interpret track condition change in light of the strength of the track. So um, adding some intelligence on top of this kind of raw change data. Um, I did want to say that we're very grateful for our uh, industry partner railroads um, for their knowledge, their expertise, um, and we're really encouraged by the strong interest demonstrated by the class one railroads in this research. And we are obviously looking forward to sharing our future results and progress updates at future conferences. Um, last but not least, I did want to thank again the FRA for uh, funding this important research and being a great organization to work with. If you have any questions about this presentation, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with myself, Richard Fox Ivy, or my colleague, Ryan Harrington. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much and have a great rest of your conference.